this video is all about different ways to requeen your colonies. In this video, I'm going to go over the four principal ways to do that. The first of those being allowing the colonies to requeen themselves. The second of those will be purchasing queen cells to place in your queenless colonies. The third would be purchasing a mated queen to requeen your colonies. And the fourth would be using a nucleus colony or a nuke to requeen colonies. Now requeening colonies is very important. It's something every beekeeper is going to have to do. So I'll go over each of these different ways to requeen colonies. I'll show you how to do it and I'll give some of the pros and cons associated with each method. The first method of requeening a colony that I'm going to demonstrate for you is allowing the colony to requeen itself. So let's talk about this just a little bit. Obviously colonies go queenless. They've been going queenless for a very, very long time well before there were people worried about making colonies queen right. So they do have a backup biological mechanism to requeen themselves. When this colony went queenless, when they lost their queen, they initiated that biological mechanism to replace that queen. And what they did is they started going, the workers started going to the youngest available female larvae, hopefully larvae that are somewhere in the neighborhood of about 12 to 24 hours old, and they took those larvae and started pushing them in the direction of becoming a queen rather than in the direction of becoming a worker. So this nest then should be full of queen cells as long as there were eggs or young larvae available to those workers to make a queen. So you've really got two scenarios here. Whatever led up to the loss of this queen would have produced a situation where either the queen was failing and had no offspring from which they could make cells, or she was not failing, she just died, in which case there are offspring available that they can make queen cells from. So if the latter case is what happened, then this colony should have made queen cells that would be available to requeen themselves. But there are a few things that I like to do when allowing a colony to requeen itself to kind of push things in the direction of success. The first of those things that I like to do is I love to go through this nest, find every queen cell, and leave the largest one or two queen cells. Personally, I prefer to leave the largest two queen cells. And the reason I do this is because the larger the cell, the more attention that female larva got while she was developing. This is an overgeneralization, but in general, the larger the cell, the bigger the larva, the bigger the larva, the more she was tended, and the younger she was when they started pushing her in the direction of becoming a queen. The reason I leave two cells rather than one is there's enough problems with queen cells today. Maybe there's a really bad egg or a really bad larvae in that cell. Maybe they develop black queen cell virus, but there are lots of reasons that can lead a queen cell to fail. So I don't wanna put all of my eggs in one basket. So if I'm allowing a colony to requeen itself, I'll go through all of the frames in the nest. I'll find the two largest queen cells. I'll remove every other queen cell and then I'll put those two largest cells near one another. So if they're on the same frame, that's great. If they're not on the same frame, I'll take those two frames and face those queen cells close to one another. And the reason I do that is the first queen to emerge will then go look for any other cells, any other queen cells that are developing and she'll kill the developing queen. I don't really want two queens emerging at the same time. I don't want them on opposite ends of the nest so that the first queen then has to go and hunt really hard. I like to make sure those two larger cells are near one another so that that process can be shortened. So some of the benefits of requeening this way is that I don't have to pay for a queen. I'm not having to give money to someone and wait for them to give me a queen. But make no mistake, this is not a free method of requeening your colonies. And the reason it's not is because when your colony goes queenless, I'm going to round everything off to the nearest week to make this kind of easier to understand. When your colony goes queenless and they make queen cells, it takes about two weeks for the queen to emerge from those cells. It takes her about two weeks to mate. And then it takes that first egg she lays three weeks to go through all of its developmental stages before you've got new brood emerging. So allowing a colony to requeen itself can cost you seven weeks or more 
of brew production. So while you're not paying someone for a queen, you are taking an economic loss. So there are times of the year requeening this method are better than other times of the year. For example, I wouldn't allow a colony to requeen itself during a nectar flow because I need bees, I need a queen, everything needs to be happening well. So I might allow a colony to requeen itself after the nectar flow. Here, that might be somewhere between July and October. It doesn't work well here after October because there's no drones available so these virgin queens have drones to mate with. You can't do this in January or February or March because there are no drones available. So while it is good and cheap and that you don't exchange money, it can cost you in other ways and there are times of the year it doesn't work well or at all. And finally, it's a bit risky. Allowing a queen to go off and mate doesn't guarantee that she will come back or maybe she mates poorly. So lots of things can happen in this method. So generally speaking, I don't requeen this way during a nectar flow. I requeen this way after the nectar flow and up until early fall. And that's the time of year I prefer to requeen this method. So with a few of those pros and cons out of the way, let's show you how to do it. So as I work this colony, all I'm going to do is go through the frames looking for queen cells and I will remove all but the largest two queen cells. Now if this colony is freshly queenless, they will not have had time to make cells themselves. So you might have to give them a week or two just to confirm. I happen to know this colony has been queenless for just long enough to have cells. Our technicians here told us there are queen cells in this nest. So I'm just going to start pulling frames and looking for the largest two to leave in the nest. So a brew frame has come out now and I'm going to look on both sides to see if I can find queen cells. There are none on this side of the frame, but as I flip this frame, I notice that there is a queen cell right here on the comb. It's a fairly large queen cell, so it's a pretty good candidate for leaving in the nest. I'm going to make sure that there are no other queen cells on this frame that I am missing. So I'll know that this is a good candidate. So I'm just going to sit it very gently on my side of the hive. I don't really want to put it on the sunny side of the hive and overheat it, so I'm going to put it just gently on my side of the nest. Taking that frame out gives me a little bit more space to work in this nest, and so now I'm going to go back to this first frame that I didn't look at initially. I can tell already that it's heavy with resources. It's exclusively honey and pollen. There are no queen cells on this frame. Now some of you watching me do this might think to yourself, well gosh, if he's got to find all the queen cells, shouldn't he be shaking all the bees from the frame so that you can see them? But remember, I want these queen cells, at least two of them, to get all the way to the stages of full development. And when you shake frames with queen cells on them, you can cause problems to the developing queen in that cell. So rather than shake the frames, I'm just being very careful to make sure that I look at the combs closely to try to find queen cells rather than remove the bees altogether. So I don't see one on this side of the frame. I don't see one on this side of the frame. And at this point, I'm just going to progress through this hive, looking at every frame until I've identified all the queen cells in the nest. So here is another one. You can see it developing well. It's quite a large queen cell. I think that's a good candidate as well. So I am going to double check the rest of this frame. Aha. I think we may even have our winner. Down here at the bottom of this frame is the largest queen cell that we've encountered so far. And so for sure, I'm going to leave this one. And I know that this one is smaller than the one that I just set outside of the hive, so I'm just going to remove it from the nest so that there's no risk at all that that colony will have a queen emerge from that cell. So now it benefits me as the beekeeper to know where this cell is so that the next time I come into this hive, I can look for it. So when I put this frame in the nest, what I like to do is make a mark with my hive tool on top of the frame so that I can identify the frame later and double check that the queen has emerged from that cell. So at this point with a great candidate here and a great candidate on the ground beside me, I'm just going to look very quickly to see if there are any larger cells and if they're not like some that I see here I'm just going to remove them from the nest as queens that I don't want emerging while I'm allowing the one to emerge 
that I want to emerge. So I flip it here, remove one that I see here. I always check closely on the bottom of the frames. I don't see one down there. And now I can return the frame. Before I return this frame, remember my advice from earlier. If I'm going to leave two queen cells that happen to be on different frames, I like to put those cells face to face on neighboring frames. So rather than return this one from which I've just removed all the cells, the other one that's got that candidate cell, not on this side of the frame, but on this side of the frame, it was right down here in the bottom, right there. So this frame and this frame I'm going to put side by side. I'm going to put this face of the frame adjacent to the face of the frame that had the other cell. I'm going to slide it right in like so. And now I'm going to mark this frame as well to let me know it is the second frame that has a cell. My queen cells are here. They were both very large. So now rather than spending too much time looking very difficult through bees on the rest of the frame, I'm going to shake the bees off of these combs and just automatically remove all the cells that I see. One here, one here, and then I'll progress through all the frames doing exactly the same thing. So now I've gone through every frame in the nest. I know where my two queen cells are. They're right here. And if I've done things well and been really gentle with those cells, a queen will emerge from one of those cells, usually in the next week or two, kill her developing sister, go out on her mating flight, and take over as the reigning matriarch in this nest. So from the point of leaving a ripe queen cell, that's a capped queen cell, I can expect to have a laying queen in here somewhere in the neighborhood of two to three weeks because it's going to take another week for her to finish developing and emerge and it'll take about two weeks for her to take her mating flights and lay her first eggs. So now I'm looking at a three week timeline at this point. And so that's the first method of requeening colonies but I quickly want to segue into the second method of requeening colonies why I have this colony open because that second method is similar to the first. In the first method I can allow a colony to requeen itself. I go through the frames, I find the two largest queen cells and I leave them. But the second method is maybe I don't have queen cells in this nest. Maybe I don't have young larvae that this colony can use to make a queen on their own. So I could go into neighboring colonies, find frames of young larvae or find queen cells to move in here. But that's still allowing the colony to requeen itself. Another option I have here if I want to go the queen cell route is you can actually purchase queen cells from queen breeders. So as an example, we have one here. Some of the benefits of going the second route to requeen is purchasing queen cells is much cheaper than purchasing fully mated queens that you'll get in queen cages. So as a result, if you're requeening lots and lots and lots of colonies, it's a cheap way to do that. Another benefit of bringing in queen cells from the outside is you're increasing the genetic diversity of the bees that you have in this apiary. So if I were to requeen using a queen cell that I purchased from a queen producer, what I would have done is removed all of the queen cells in this nest. And then I will take this queen cell and make a space for it between two frames and then just gently slide it between two frames in the nest. And now you've got very similar pros and cons associated with this method as you would with allowing them to requeen themselves. Some of the pros being it's cheaper, you know, you allow it to happen. It might take a little bit more time, but you bring in genetic diversity. Some of the associated cons, of course, is yeah, you've got queen cells coming in from the outside, but the moment she emerges, she still takes a week to emerge, two weeks to mate, three weeks for her eggs to go through all the developmental stages before you have her brood. Also, you can't do this at times of the year that there are no drones available because she's going to come out and need to mate with available drones. So to summarize, you can allow the colony to requeen itself. You can purchase and bring in 
ripe queen cells from a breeder. Both of those have similar pros and cons. And now let's move on to talk about the third way that you can requeen colonies. So now I'm at another queenless colony in this apiary to describe for you a third way to requeen colonies. And this is probably the most known, maybe one of the most utilized methods to requeen colonies, or at least the most utilized of the last three methods. A lot of people just allow colonies to requeen themselves because it seems to be a simpler thing. But if you're going to take steps to help, usually it's this one that pops in, and that's purchasing a queen from a queen breeder and using that queen to fix that colony problem immediately. So in this case, we have a queen in a queen cage. If you purchase a queen from a breeder, that queen is going to come to you in a queen cage. This is a plastic queen cage. Now there are many different types of queen cages. There are wooden queen cages, etc. but they all have similar um, strategies for introducing queens. First, they always contain some sort of mesh material. Here, you see this plastic mesh. This mesh allows the bees in this colony to become accustomed to this queen through that mesh while that queen remains in this cage. The second thing you'll notice is this cage has a tube that is stuffed full of what we call in the beekeeping world candy. It's really a type of fondant, usually powdered sugar and honey or powdered sugar and sugar water to make this pliable candy. And the idea here is if you simply release the queen into the nest, these bees don't know her, so they'd kill her. So what you want to do is allow them to get to know the queen through the cage screen while chewing through the candy such that by the time they get through the candy and she has a clear path out of this cage, they will have accepted her so that when she comes through, they'll take her and life is good. So the design of this particular cage is such that it can neatly fit between frames like so. So this is an example of a wooden queen cage and it's very similar in function to this plastic queen cage. In this case, it's got three little circular compartments with this third compartment would be full of candy. Just like this plastic queen cage would have candy here, this third compartment would have candy here. So the queen and her attendants, if it comes with attendants, would be running around in the cage and both ends of the cage have a cork. And so what you would do if you were introducing the wooden cage into this nest to allow the queen to come out, you would remove the cork on the candy end, then you would turn the screen perpendicular to the comb. If you turn the screen towards the comb, the bees can't get accustomed to the queen through the screen because they can't access it. So you turn the screen perpendicular to the comb. I don't generally like my candy to be straight up, so I would tilt it in this case. So if the candy melts, it runs down the face of the screen. I don't like to put my candy straight down again because if attendant bees die, they can block the hole. So I put the candy up in this case, tilt it, and then I push it between two frames. These two frames would have to come out. I'd push it in the frame on one side, push it in the frame of the other side at that angle, and then the bees would go through that candy similar to how they go through this candy. So the wooden cage is actually a, probably a more popular style, but you can't insert it without taking out two frames. So now that you understand a little bit about the construction of standard queen cages, requeening with a mated queen is actually fairly simple. All you have to do is put this queen cage into this hive. So a couple things about this. First, you need to go through every frame in this nest and remove all queen cells if this colony has set queenless for even a, a day. Because what happens is when this colony goes queenless, they immediately initiate the queen replacement strategy. They start building queen cells. If you purchase a queen and stick her into this hive while they have queen cells, it can reduce the chances that they will accept your queen in favor of the queens that they are producing. So normally I would go through all of the frames in this hive, remove all of the queen cells, which would then allow me to introduce this queen cage. So how am I going to introduce this queen cage? Well, this is really the simplest queen cage to introduce. It's so slim, it just slides right between frames. So at this point, if I've removed all the queen cells, all I have to do is use my hive tool to open up a space between two frames, usually about the center of the nest. Now, what am I going to do? Well, I don't like to put my candy end straight up. If it gets really hot and that candy melts, it can run down into the cage and kill the queen. 
Likewise, I don't like to put the candy in straight down if attendant workers are in the cage. In this case, there are no attendant workers, but a lot of times queen producers will sell you cages that have attendant workers. And so why wouldn't I put the candy in down if it's got attendant workers? Well, if the bees from this hive eat through this candy and one of the attendant workers has died, she might fall to block that escape route for the queen. So instead, what I like to do is have that candy running horizontal, right? That way, if an attendant worker dies, she won't block that tube for the queen to get out. And the same is true if I'm using a wooden cage or this plastic cage. So again, not straight up, not straight down, but rather this sideways configuration. And in this particular case, assuming I've removed all the cells, all I have to do is place this queen cage towards the center of the nest. And I might even wedge the frames together just a little bit because I wanna ensure that those frames are holding that queen cage so that the cage doesn't fall to the bottom of the hive. And the bees should finish eating through the candy in that cage somewhere in the neighborhood of two to three days. They will release the queen after that candy has been eaten through. So if you come back a week later, if she's been accepted, you're likely to find eggs throughout the nest because your new queen has started laying. Why do I like requeening with this method of requeening? Well, I like it because you're bringing in outside genetic diversity. I like it because you're putting a fully mated queen into this hive. You've cut out those two weeks of development. You've cut out those two weeks of mating. And so you've basically saved yourself a month of brood production. Yes, she has to come out. She has to start laying eggs. Yes, those eggs take 21 days to develop fully. But you're not talking about seven or eight weeks, you're talking about three weeks before this queen's offspring start coming out in the nest. Now, the most significant drawback related to requeening this way is that occasionally when the bees release her, they will not have accepted her and they'll kill her. So you may have paid dozens and dozens of dollars for this queen, the bees released her into the nest and then they killed her. So it can take a second queen, and hopefully not, but maybe even a third queen. And so if that process fails, it can cost you lots of money. But on the other hand, a lot of people really like the pluses that come around with requeening using this method. Now let me tell you about my fourth way of requeening colonies. This way happens to be my favorite way, and that way is using a queen in a nuke to requeen a queenless production colony. So this colony is queenless and I'm going to go into its brood nest and proceed through all of the frames to double check to confirm that they're queenless. If they're queenless, I'm going to use this nuke to requeen it. Now you heard me say the queen from this nuke, so you automatically probably thought that I was going to cage this queen and move just the queen over, but that's not what I'm doing. I'm taking every frame bees, brood, honey, pollen, queen and all, and I'm moving every frame from this nuke into this brood box to instantly requeen this colony. Why is this my favorite way of requeening a colony? Well, first of all, it solves the problem instantly. There's no cage, there's no mating, there's no stall period, etc. But really my favorite reason that this is my favorite way to requeen colonies, if you think about it, the need to requeen a colony comes with some sort of collateral damage that you are recognizing. The colony's queenless, maybe she's failing, maybe they're broodless, maybe they've swarmed. There's a whole litany of reasons that you may want to requeen a colony. Well, these other three methods, allowing the colony to requeen itself, purchasing and inserting queen cells, or purchasing and inserting mated queens, these really only solve the direct issue. They replace the queen but they don't solve the collateral damage of fewer bees, less brood, less honey, and less pollen. So requeening with a nuke not only puts a queen in this nest, but it also it comes with collateral benefits. More bees, more brood, more honey, more pollen. It's almost like this colony was never queenless at all. The downside of this is it requires you to have nukes on hand to be available for you to requeen. But what I tell new beekeepers especially, for about every 10 colonies I have in an apiary, I have one to two nukes on the side that exist solely for the purpose of solving a problem. We have a problem, I have a nuke, let's solve this problem using this nuke.
So let me tell you the basic premise of requeening with a nuke. Essentially, this colony has 10 frames. The nuke has five frames. I am going to remove five frames from this colony to make room for the five frames from that nuke. Now, a couple things I could do here. Those five frames I remove from this colony might have bees and brood and queen cells. Well, if I'm interested in keeping this nuke alive, I would take out five frames that have bees and brood and a couple of queen cells and set them aside. Because once I move these nuke frames into this hive, I'll have an empty nuke box into which I can put those five frames that I've just taken out of this colony. So essentially I will be keep creating a queenless nuke and my motto is, is I allow my nukes to have the problem, not my production colony. So I'd be moving frames of bees and frames of brood over with some queen cells and then I would go through that and allow it to requeen itself by removing all but the two largest queen cells. But there are some scenarios that your parental colony is not strong enough to contribute future frames to replenish this nuke. In which case, all I'm going to do is go through this colony and remove all the frames that have nothing or no brood or are only honey and pollen. And remember, I've got five frames here, so I need to remove five frames here. So I've gone through this hive, gone through every frame, and the frames that I'm leaving in the nest, I've removed all of the queen cells. Also, the frames that I'm leaving in the nest, I've moved to one side of this box. And so what I'm going to do at this point is so simple and it's so intuitive, but I get so many questions about it. All I'm going to do is take those frames, free running queen and all, and put into this box. And so the reason I scooted these frames all to one side is so that this nuke colony can remain together as they slowly integrate. Now, a word about this integration before I do it. If you've read the bee books, it will tell you at this point, spray everybody with sugar syrup so that the bees can get to know each other while cleaning one another. Or it may have told you to put an empty box here with a sheet of newspaper between the two. And as the bees chew through that newspaper, they get introduced to one another. You don't need to do that. Too much time, no benefit at all. All I'm going to do is remove the frames with a free running queen from here and place in here. You notice I said free running queen. I don't cage the queen in the nuke before I move it over. I'm okay that she's free running. But if you're tentative about doing this, you could always find her in the nuke, cage her, move all the frames with her over, leave her in here caged for three or four days and then come back and manually release her. I don't do that, but if you're tentative about this whole process, you can do that. So I've got this nuke. I open this nuke and slide it a little bit closer to me. And it's really that simple. Bees, brood, and everything come right into the empty space I've created. So I'll remove the first frame from the nuke. This is a good resource frame, I can tell. And I like to have my resources on the outside, so I'll put one frame of resources here. Just looking from above, I can tell that the next three frames are brood, so I'm putting them next. Now that last frame is a resource frame, and even though normally bees like resources on the outside the box, I like to use this resource frame almost as a, the same purpose that candy serves in the queen cage. As they kind of mingle at that resource frame, they become accustomed to the new queen. So I will put these resources right between. And now what I've got is I'm sliding this last frame in. I have used the queen, the bees, the brood, and everything from this nuke to requeen this colony. It works if the colony swarm. It works if this colony has laying workers. It works if you have to kill the queen. It works in December. It works in March. It works every time of the year, which is why I love it. Now, at this point, if I were interested in making a new nuke, the five frames that had a couple of queen cells that came from this colony would go into the nuke. I'd leave the nuke in this apiary or take it to another apiary while they requeen themselves. But my nuke has the problem, not my production colony. This is my favorite way of requeening. So at this point, I've gone over the four major ways of requeening colonies. First of those, allowing colonies to requeen themselves. Second, purchase queen cells from a producer that you insert into a colony. The third, requeening with a mated queen that you purchase. The fourth, my favorite, using a nuke. You'll always want to requeen colonies after you've dequeened colonies. They can't be queen right. You want to make sure and manage the queen cells left behind. 
so there's no conflict of interest between the sales the colony's making and what you're introducing. But if you follow these steps using these different four methods, you'll be able to solve a lot of the queen issues that you have in your apiary.